So uh, good evening, everyone. On behalf of the Department of English, Midnapur College Autonomous, I extend you all who are present over the other side of this virtual platform today. A hearty welcome for today's talk to be delivered by our uh, esteemed resource person, uh, Monica Nikadotto from University of Oxford. So before she begins, I would like to introduce our resource persons today. And it's a part of our regular exercise. It's a part of our uh, departmental regular exercise, I think. So uh, she has completed her DPhil from the University of Oxford. Her doctoral thesis that I like to sum up in this few words that looked into the health and welfare of European seamen in British in the British naval and merchant fleet on board ships in Indian port cities in the 19th century. It examined the sanitary regulations and maritime hygiene implemented by the British Empire to protect the health of their seamen. She has many research paper essays to her credit published on different platforms. Uh, uh, again, uh, to that credit, uh, she has a post uh, podcast on, on disease and colonialism, uncomfortable Oxford, uh, coronavirus pandemic, is it unprecedented? Historians tell us uh, what we can learn from the past. Uh, she's a contributor uh, to the Oxford COVID-19 government response tracker. Recently, she had media interviews on today's news channel, on Aztok news channel. So today we are going to listen to her talking on modernity, risk, health, and contagion. As we all have been waiting eagerly to listen to her, so I would not uh, waste my time, our, your time. I would now request our research person's uh, respected Monica Nika Dotto ma'am to begin the lecture. And uh, uh, welcome you, ma'am, to this virtual platform. And I, on behalf of the Department of English, Minapur College, I welcome you to this uh, online lecture series. Uh, over to you. Now the floor is yours. And this is the uh, information for the uh, those who are listening the talk on YouTube and Facebook. They, if they have any questions after the end of the talk, they can drop down in the comment section of YouTube and Facebook those questions or any kind of observation if they like to put so and uh, at the end of the talk i will bring out those questions those observations to our research persons so what to you ma'am yeah uh, thank you so much don Moy, for having me and uh, and again i would like to extend thanks to uh Bindapur college as well for having me over and uh, i have been kind of following your seminar series which i find really interesting you've been able to kind of get so many you know uh, aspects have been covered and so many guests have been invited from different uh, fields. Uh, so again, um, so when you kind of wrote to me and you know asking me on what uh, if I could like present on this platform, and I was thinking that what um, you know what I could say, and in general, you know there has been this interest over the months on uh, generally over the history of pandemics and epidemics. And uh, you know, and what kind of impact, and how to kind of relate that with the COVID nineteen pandemic, and uh, I just thought that you know it would have be uh, it it let people might just have been exhausted by listening to what happened in the eighteen nineteenth century and the history of epidemics and pandemics because there have been so many webinars around you know, so uh, so today I so I decided that you know let me just kind of talk about something more contemporary. So I decided kind of to talk about modernity uh, as I kind of. Uh, uh, name uh, name today's lecture modernity risk health and contagion so um so just to, uh, before i kind of get on with my uh, talk i would uh, like to kind of um, say a few words about um, the present scenario okay like uh, kind of just to brief you with the current updates because i'm sure like uh, you know everyone has been more or less um, everyone is aware of what's been happening but we have also been quite taken up and exhausted with the you know increasing numbers and the and you know every day the uh, the kind of news that have been coming up be it uh, the general social media or uh, you know or the conservative media in the sense like tv and radio and so on so a uh, coronavirus that is kind of continuing to its spread across the world and by now it has uh, we have 22 million confirmed cases across 188 countries and about 800,000 people have lost their lives to COVID-19. Um, 
So when I say COVID-19, so COVID-19 and it's associated and if, if there are any um, uh, cases of com uh, comor uh, comorbidities as well has been kind of included in this figure. Now, cases of diseases are continuing to surge in many countries, as we have seen. And in fact, there has been a second wave of uh, COVID-19 that is, um, you know, that that is kind of resurged in the in the last few weeks, if I could say. Now, um, as of now, Brazil has uh, after uh, United States uh, obviously goes into the first rank and then comes Brazil. Which is second, which is uh, which is the second highest number of cases in the world, and has recorded more than one one four two five zero deaths. Mexico again has uh, in that area, I would say, has um, is a huge has has reported huge number of deaths, about sixty thousand k uh, sixty thousand and counting. And uh, situation in the neighboring countries is Colombia, Peru, Argentina, Venezuela has also been alarming. And now coming to India, India has become the third country to pass 2 million cases. And by now, it has kind of crossed 3 million positive cases as of now. And um, in fact, India is recording and generating the highest number of uh, daily new cases in the world. And uh, so, and obviously, because of the complexities and, and, the, and the fact that, you know, India is obviously because of the size and the population, the heterogeneity of the, of the population, it's just becoming more and more difficult to kind of control the number of cases, but nevertheless, we are fighting. Uh, again, in the Middle East, if we go, Iran has been badly affected by the virus and uh, documents that had been leaked to the BBC Persian service, it suggests that the actual death toll is more than double the official toll of 20,000. So this is something that I don't think is just very specific to um, Iran itself, but in uh, like I don't think uh, the government figures are exact, as we all know, and we are all aware of. Uh, similar, the cases in Iraq, the the uh, the cases are that there's a spike in cases there as well. Cases continue in Indonesia and um, you know and other Southeast Asian countries uh, to cover like the South Korea, Japan. In fact, there has been a uh, resurgence of cases. Now, um, again, to, when we come to Africa, Africa too has kind of recorded more than a million confirmed cases as of now, although the true extent of the pandemic is obviously unknown. And uh, because when and when we're talking about these figures, it's very important to note that the testing rates are reportedly low in many of these countries, right? So we uh, so because of which we really don't know what the exact figures are. So what we could just re uh, do is rely on the official figures and maybe figures, um, you know, from non-governmental organizations, and just to have uh, and and uh, when we say that. Again, in South Africa and Egypt as well, there has been uh, the COVID-19. It has there has been like uh, real bad outbreaks and large outbreaks in South Africa, too. In uh, and uh, and when I was mentioning that there has been a rising case in Europe, so uh, so to mention here, France, Spain, Italy, Germany. In fact, Germany had been able to kind of had done reasonably well in the in in the month of March and April compared to the other European countries and there too the the numbers are again rising and uh, and recently the World Health Organization the WHO uh, has warned us of a resurgence of the disease in Europe South Korea which had uh, which we uh, which uh, the news channels have been reporting that they have done pretty well and they had imposed uh, tough restrictions and again is uh, back with another new outbreak so there is this constant counting and updating of information and you know in the in the and the world covid you know covid tracker in fact every country has their own website and kind of you know and then the news the news media is constantly flashing numbers and you know those numbers are constantly growing every single day but in fact as i speak now the numbers are increasing and uh, this is also to kind of certify that you know we are not uh, allowed to forget that we are living in the age of a pandemic so even if you want to kind of try to kind of uh, be in a sin, uh, be in a space that you would just like to shut yourself out, you're not allowed to do so. Uh, so um, so when I'm, when I'm talking about pandemic, it's very important to know that you know these days, and especially with the outbreak of COVID nineteen, as we have seen, that um, that risk has been very uh, you know this this term risk has been uh, intertwined with uh, 
and the outbreak and also like um so pandemics in fact are being understood and explained through the risk and the threat um uh, and uh, you know that it kind of imposes on people and on neighboring nations and uh, and internationally so this threat could be uh, it, it is understood generally uh, internationally it's understood in terms of security threat so and uh, but but that's not just a, uh, you know i would not say the threat is just to do with the international threat uh, as it's perceived but for example even if if i would give the example of india that west bengal uh, chief minister has has kind of had uh, imposed this strict um, uh, you know measures to kind of a uh, lockdown measures in the sense that you know from uh, i think in india like six cities um uh, like uh, flights coming down from six cities were not allowed to uh, come in into the calcutta airport so apart from the other international um yeah uh, you know uh, uh, restrictions travel restrictions even the state uh, you know with, because india is a federal state so uh, state with, uh, so the uh, the the state within the country has also kind of um so is kind of understood the you know like they are kind of posing threat to the neighboring states as well now um as we all know and that by now because there have been again as i say there have been a huge amount of uh, you know like news media and reports and um, literature uh, in the last few months on pandemic and understanding epidemics but uh, just just to give you a, a brief um, uh, overview uh, that pandemic as we understand now has not been this it, it's it, this exact term pandemic was not properly used until the outbreak of the flu 1918 flu pandemic if i could call it so because in 19th century and even obviously even before that we've been having um, outbreaks such as cholera and plague that have been uh, that have been extremely uh, that have been to be extremely dangerous but nevertheless um, this entire idea of pandemic and how it's associated with risk has never really uh, re uh, has never really surfaced in 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 the in the way it it's it's doing it, it's un being understood now so now diseases are now to be managed and people are uh, rather uh, they're going to be put under surveillance that has been kind of going on, uh, that we have been facing as of now and and again the scale of pandemic as i as i mentioned some time back is now in understood in terms of risk and secretization and um so when i speak about um risk and security and surveillance and um and, and to some extent maybe social control i would like to mention that uh over here that virtually all countries okay not just uh, when i'm talking about when i mean all countries i would like to emphasize that it's not just the the notable you know the the wealthier countries like suppose such as united states or united kingdom or or, or the european countries the western european countries um that you know they have uh, that they are more um and the southeast asian like japan south korea or china for that matter um but rather all countries now pro uh, possess their risk registers as they're called now and uh, figuratively and the private sectors in fact universities as well they have their own risk index which you know kind of helps them enables the government as well as the intergovernmental or the non, non governmental or the businesses how business houses to identify the potential risk to population and supply chains so what do i what do i mean by this for example in universities not just due to covid but even prior to that um in my own university when i was a student i suppose if i had to go to india or students coming from um, africa or or other um, you know countries that were supposedly under quote unquote um you know under uh, greater uh, you know a put, uh, that had kind of potential risk to uh, certain diseases they had to kind of you know sign up a form or you know given a kind of you know submitted written document that you know you're kind of visiting this particular place so that you know, so that the university could kind of have um, you know could track down or they had some records to kind of fall back to um now countries are ranked and classified according to different risk levels okay along three indices in generally i'm saying now it could uh, this is the risk of emergence of new strains the risk of the spread and the capacity of states to contain an epidemic so um because 
suppose if, if uh, because it's understood in the in the, the last point that I mentioned that the capacity of states to contain an epidemic. What do you mean by that? That suppose like the third world, for example, um, according to the first world country, some of them they would not be uh, well equipped or that equipped to kind of um, contain an epidemic. But this is something that has been completely uh, challenged, and it has be, uh, and it has been kind of uh, almost turned over by what COVID nineteen has proven. For example, the United States, which is uh, which is the richest country in the world, have not done well, as we have seen. Be it in the uh, it it could be due to their um, you know their public health measures, their healthcare sector has not been able to perform as expected out of a first world country. Similarly, United Kingdom also uh, in the first few months have not done uh, as as you know as expected. Similarly, you, uh, the western the Western European countries, compared to other maybe. Um, you know, other other small, uh, small, not smaller countries, but other less influential countries, um, like perhaps um, uh, South Korea or e even uh, Indonesia, or and in in fact New Zealand and uh, has also performed really well. Uh, now, um, when we're talking about um, you know these uh, pandemic and um, and risk and and things like that we need to kind of understand also that there are a lot of social and cultural factors and uh, along with environmental and uh, uh, factors that needs to be kind of considered when regulations are kind of imposed um, and thus we see that you know this entire thing of uh, risk security and pandemic as uh, mark harrison has argued are bound together in a very powerful nexus so um, the last point that I mentioned about um, you know about the uh, about this uh, social and the cultural aspect of it um, is that suppose um, the, for example, if I would like to give an example here, is that um, every nation or every culture, every society responds to a particular disease in a different way. So uh, when we're talking about um, constant, other than other than the government uh, intervention in the form of testing, the the people have been kind of asked to kind of man, uh, maintain social distancing, or rather, I would like to say physical distancing. Now, um, and now, it, it can be seen that you know in in countries like perhaps like Scandinavian countries uh, i'm not bringing here sweden but other countries where where, uh, where families maybe are of um, they have smaller families and um, and and also like you know the the housing they arranged in such a way that there there is uh, there's a lot of space from one another they are not um, they are not all held up all together and uh, there uh, there are um, and the social structure is such that has that kind of um, makes uh, this physical distancing, if, as I say, easier compared to uh, someone living in um, in in suppose in uh, for example in uh, West Bengal or in Calcutta and um, or you know especially the ones living in the slums because of their insanitary conditions uh, in living conditions. Or it could be for the fact that that their um, that their houses are spaced in such a way that uh, that that you know they are very close to one another, and uh, like the problems of urban centers in general. So so here again, uh, when I'm talking about urban centers, I could just um, uh, I could just mention that you know we have seen that it's been the bigger cities, you know that have that be it London, be it New York, that have. Um, and that have been, uh, you know, like greatly uh, uh, affected by COVID-19. Now, when we're talking about security and risk, I would like to mention about the border closures and other travel restrictions during the last five months after the, uh, you know, after the COVID-19 outbreak. Now, July 16, 2020, New, uh, New York Times reports coronavirus travel restrictions across the globe that, uh, that nations across the world have imposed travel restrictions to curb the spread of the coronavirus, and at least 93% of the global population now lives in countries with coronavirus-related travel restrictions, with approximately 3 billion people. Okay, the, the number it says is 3 billion people residing in countries enforcing people border 
uh, closures to foreigners, according to the recent analysis by the Pew Research Center. And it also kind of lists countries and territories that have restricted travels, pulled down from the official government reports and state departments, and uh, that are kind of uh, updated and uh, constantly. Now, just to give you an idea about the extreme measures that have been taken as far as travel restrictions are concerned, uh, and so it could be in the form of closure, border, clo uh, border closures or, as, or uh, lockdown measures. Uh, for example, um, just to give you a very a brief overview of the uh, the world status in in Canada or in the Caribbean, most foreign nationals are banned from entering Canada, and obviously there are exemptions that could be in form of Canadian citizens and permanent citizens and so on. And uh, again, in United States, there are restrictions there as well. So um, uh, anyone uh, like um, anyone permitted to enter will be screened upon arrival and asked to self quarantine for 14 days. Uh, the same uh, situation is very similar in case of Central American uh, countries where it could be Belize, El Salvador, Guatemala, Nicaragua or Honduras. And uh, same in case of South America, some of the countries uh, I would like to mention is Argentina, Bolivia, Chile, Colombia, Africa, Algeria. And in Africa, there is Algeria, Angola, um, uh, Botswana, Ghana, Morocco. And again, in Asia, we, we know like there is China, India, Indonesia, Sri Lanka, Japan, etc. And uh, again, Australia and New Zealand too, they have all travelers except uh, for returning New Zealanders are denied entry. So uh, here we see that everyone except those, uh, you know, the foreign national, except uh, mo uh, mostly the foreign nationals are not allowed to travel. Uh, though I would like to mention here that in Europe, uh, the borders are, the, many of these European nations uh, have uh, kind of opened their borders. So people are traveling, suppose for, uh, for example, from um, United Kingdom to France, or Spain for a holiday, but nevertheless, as a result of which we are seeing that there are increasing number of cases over the last two to three weeks at a time when, uh, uh, like, for example, the United Kingdom had been doing um, comparatively well, again, the numbers are rising. And, uh, and when I kind of mention everything, I would like to end with China because and it's from here that everything began and this entire um, episode began so with over there the website too says that the um that COVID 19 is now a global pandemic and in a bit to prevent a second wave of the outbreak at home china has not given up on drastic measures to contain infections or possibility of reinfection reinfection is the word they have used and however with the uh, epidemic and domestic area basically under control the country has recently begun relaxing tra travel restrictions so yes, this is something that we have seen that travel restrictions over the last one, uh, one and a half months have been comparatively relaxed. So people are now traveling from one place to the other, especially in case of emergencies. Uh, for example, India has this uh, their um, their own uh, mission called the Bhar uh, Vande Bharat mission, where the, str the the stranded citizens and you know people who who are in need are able to travel from one place to the other. Now, uh, um, now, now I'm talking about the risk. One thing that is very important to understand is the global awareness and the cooperation or the collaboration that have been emphasized when it comes to control and eradication of the disease outbreak. Um, so when I say that, I would, uh, uh, what, do I, what do I mean by that? Is that um, when the world, okay, so pandemic is generally, when a disease spreads over across countries and across countries, right? So, and especially in the case of COVID-19, as we've seen that, as I mentioned very early in my talk, that uh, almost 8, 188 countries have been affected. So when, I'm, uh, when the, when the uh, problem is so pressing, it needs kind of global, when if it's a global health security problem, it kind of also kind of requires um, much greater awareness and a, a cooperation and collaboration as far as the individual countries and the agencies and communities are concerned. This is something that we have seen from the very uh, from the very beginning, that there has been a lot of emphasis that has been given on, ex you know, on that of uh, exchange of information, for example. So whatever uh, research, medical research and innovation is taking place in one part of the world is kind of immediately we are made aware of that. 
So it could be in the form of vaccination and uh, or or if, if there is any um, any update with medical research in case of um, any uh, any uh, pill coming up or or whatever may it be. Now. Um, more than I think, uh, the, you know, the global strategy towards gl global public health has now kind of uh, has has kind of undergone a shift. So now we are more rather than eradication elimination at this point, we are rather we are thinking about, you know, how to kind of um, invest in sp supposedly through in a vaccination and other countermeasures to kind of build up a stronger health system. Um, I would like to write, uh, read out a quote by Bill Gates, and uh, uh, who was who was the Microsoft corporation uh, corporation chairman in, in 2011. He said that even though we can't compute the odds for threats like bioterrorism or pandemic, it's important to have the right people worrying about them and taking steps to minimize the likelihood and potential impact. But bioterrorism and pandemics are the only threats I can foresee that could kill over a million, over a billion people. Sorry. So, um, so this is something that um, that you know uh, that the, 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 at the end of the day, when we're talking about risk, and it could be obviously it could cover environmental risk in the form of ecological system that we, that needs attention. It could be um, terrorism that needs attention. And uh, you know, and other uh, and other problems, social uh, social inequal uh, inequities and uh, inequalities, and so on and so forth. But still, health remains to be uh, remains you know the the biggest worry. So the UN system uh, influenza uh, influenza coordinator David Navarro in 2013 said that preparedness, including for potential pandemics, requires coordination and management of complex relationships across different sectors between international, national, and local actors. We must work together in support of all societies as they prepare in ways that reflect the interest of all people or for whom preparations are being made. A community-based One Health approach is essential for reducing the risk to people that emerge as interfaces between animals, humans and ecosystem so the last line i would like to repeat it again a community-based one health approach is essential so when you're talking about global health risk and threat that you know that one can overcome that only when there is a community-based one health approach so you cannot say that you know that oh and that only the uh, so it's so help is needed and cooperation collaboration is needed across from uh, you know uh, from countries across the globe um similarly in october 2014 um you know just at the height of the west uh, the west african ebola outbreak the director general of the world health organization commented that in my long career in public health i've never seen a health event strike such fear and terror well beyond the affected countries now this is very interesting that, he, that we hear uh, Margaret Chan says that he's never seen a uh, health event strike such fear and terror. Uh, why I say so is that because uh, this widespread, you know, sense of being at risk, again, that, you know, th this particular term that is being repeated, especially over the last decade or so, is, um, is, 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 is quite remarkable. And this is uh, because of its the fact that you know, like the the the, uh, the, the like uh, the likelihood of the infection was very much low, so uh, so this is something very interesting that when you're talking about what is at risk and what kind of informs that risk and what is risky, if I could call it, if I could just say, uh, kind of depends. So uh, we've seen that this entire. Um, and you know this entire um, episode that has kind of taken place, and this um, and this and this entire worry and this ex entire anxiety over the COVID nineteen, is perhaps also because of the fact that it's a community. It's not perhaps it is because because it's a communicable disease, right? So it's infectious. So by that I I would say so it's it, it kind of gets transmitted uh, from human to human, uh, from human to human transmission as of now. So this is something that is very important uh, because, as as we see that there are right, uh, there is a huge, huge rise in cases of uh, in cancer, 
num uh, cancer or diabetes or in fact uh, in us obesity is a, is a big issue but we we are not really worried uh, in that uh, to that extent as we kind of um, we are worried about an infectious disease right and that is because of his, of the fact that it could just spread um you know it that that would have been widespread and um that is something that we fear so um so so in the, uh, starting from to, uh, especially in the last ten, uh, last decade there has been uh, you know like a lot of stories where people are uh, uh, stories as i say media reports and um, uh, and stories uh, saying and trying to kind of make us aware and trying to kind of guard us or rather warn us and that if if that there just might be other uh, that uh, this uh, that there just might be a pandemic a flu pandemic on its way and uh, we have we are aware that there have been sars before sars mars and uh, and so on and so forth um before uh, before covid-19 struck so the atlantic kind of published a story in the july august 19th issue of 2018 titled the next plague is coming is america ready it stated that the uh, the epidemics of the early 21st century revealed a world un prepared even as the risk continue to multiply much worse is coming and unfortunately this was proven to be true right uh, so in fact bbc future in 2018 reported that the experts believed that the flu pandemic was only a matter of time and there could have been millions of undiscovered viruses in the world with one expert telling uh, telling um, the uh, telling bbc that i think the chances that the next epidemic will be caused by a novel virus are quite good so this is something that uh, so uh, so by this what i'm trying to get at is the fact that you know when we're talking about risk and risk management and disease management perhaps we just uh, we as a society the government um at the government as a whole and you know international organizations um you know like somewhere uh, somewhere down the line they were aware or they were kind of anticipating that uh, that the world would be facing a pandemic what obviously uh, the the world and no one, and something that it was completely unprecedented or something that that you know the, not just the global spread because the global spread of a pandemic has happened before it could be uh, in the case of um right i could go back to the black death whether you, uh, the, the entire europe was ravaged or we can go back to 19th century cholera or we could talk about the plague um or or even the flu pandemic that kind of uh, that kind of was responsible to killing more people than the world war so that was uh, something that the uh, um, the figures goes up from it varies from 50 million to 100 million right and out of that 100 million um 20 15 to 20 million in india alone i would like to point out to that as well so now um when we're talking about infectious uh, diseases and we're talking about pandemic before covid-19 struck as perhaps it was uh, i would like to kind of mention here the case of ebola and uh, although the disease it it had high mortality rate and its transmission vector um, it was mostly via bodily fluids and it and it but what happened was because the transmission was due uh, uh, you know was uh, due to bodily fluids it's, it was kind of made it uh, it was made relatively difficult for individuals to become infected so it was not as infectious or it it was not as easily transmissible so thus um, just to give you an example here that uh, when the scottish nurse uh her name was pauline uh, caffley uh, and she flew from london to glasgow and she was infected with the virus and uh, but nevertheless no other co passenger on that flight became infected as a result so this entire tension between feeling at risk and the low likelihood of being infected this is something that i would like to kind of point out out so um so like um so so this is not to suggest that there has been this a uh, misperception on the level of risk but uh, rather and uh, rather it's about like um what we understand by risk and as i again say how societies uh, as a whole uh, how different societies and communities we kind of react to the risk and um now uh, 
and uh, so so as i mentioned because of the fact that covid-19 has is a communicable disease and to threat the 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 perceived threat is far greater and obviously the measures has been and the responses has been quite extraordinary from closure of uh, you know arranging from the uh, closure of borders to travel restrictions to in, in fact even um, you know like um, curfews have been imposed and so on and so forth and um, and when we're talking about global health and you know and this entire uh, when we're talking about global health and the risk frame one thing that we uh, uh, we need to understand is it's definitely not a value free approach and by that what we mean is that bullet politics is intrinsic to the manner in which you know these discourses of risk is con is constructed and um, to give you again an example here is that um you know uh, from um, maybe in the case just uh, to give you an example from the indian case as well that you know there was this um, incident of tablighi jamaat in the month of march and uh, and obviously and, uh, and and i will go into the greater details of how risk groups are kind of uh, identified later is kind of had was um you know been pointed at and and very off late and and that was a time then people were not even you know when i say people i say the indian people were not even aware of the scale of the pandemic and very recently um the indian government uh, and uh, when i say indian government the prime minister uh, and uh, and the ruling party uh, along with the others played a very significant role in when and coming back uh, when when uh, during the ram mandir a uh, yelling of the um uh, you know the laying of the brick and 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 all the exhibition that uh, kind of that and the political exhibition that and that kind of went on so um so when we are talking about uh, uh, uh health and you know politics of health this is something very important that politics is something that cannot be you know uh, you know um you know uh, that cannot be disassociated with what's going on in 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 the nation and in the country and over health overall in the government so there has been the stab of wars between china the chinese government and the and and, and the president uh, president trump the, the president of united states and you know uh, trump went on to say calling the, the calling this particular coronavirus as the chinese virus and in fact chinese plague he has i think last uh, last month or a couple of months back kind of also labeled it as chinese plague so so there's a lot of politics that kind of goes on right now um this is because you know like when we, when we are talking about politics it kind of uh, also helps to mobilize public attention and political attention right so it, so it's it's a two way process so the global health um, you know the problem global health kind of feeds into politics and politics again goes back and feeds into uh, you know the wider social uh, the wider problem the disease outbreak now um now when i'm saying that uh, obviously when so in fact there was a the the un general assembly had multiple meetings on health issues uh, since 2000 okay so be it in the case of hiv which is the aids in aids or the non communicable diseases or or uh, in fact the ebola response or the anti microbial that is the amr um, in 2016 and uh, and it kind of you know declared that these outbreaks may constitute risk to stability as well as to national and international peace and security and numerous new programs organizations and initiatives have emerged at the global level so and 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 you know this narrative of this health is global kind of came up along with it right and global when we are saying that the health is global it requires global response so um but uh, so and so forth it's all good that you know that all nations need to be a player equal uh, you know uh, not an equal but uh, needs to kind of chip in and play a, a an important role in order to kind of um, contain the disease but one thing that we really need to remember that uh, that that some populations or some countries are likely to be affected by the health uh, you know greater affected by the health problems than the other or when we'm saying people it can be uh, some uh, you know it could be the country it could be the ethnic group it could be uh, the minorities and so and so forth now um 
so you know i have been using this uh, this term risk society which i need to kind of uh, just to give you um, in just mention that um, i have been kind of uh, reading up um, the sociologist ulrich beck and uh, and um, i kind of just uh, borrowed some of his ideas in order to understand uh, risk and uh, you know and what he meant by risk and uh, and obviously i kind of you know tried to kind of uh, you know um, and take that into my stride and understand that how risk not only internationally how that work but just even within the different social strata and within communities so when they're talking about risk a society as ulrich beck uh, goes on to say that you know it, he's talking he claims that the new technologies and their associated risk are creating a new era an advanced stage of modernity that is freeing itself uh, from the contours of classical industrial society forging a new form the industrial risk society and he's talking about the you know there is a post modernization that is going to place and and a very interesting uh, thing that he mentions here that if, when we're talking about risk it's that it's not just uh, one particular group uh, group is uh, is at risk but everyone so it's not just you know it's he's not understanding risk in the form of binaries that is the rich versus poor or the able versus disabled but rather he states that he's saying that when you're we are at risk it's we are all together in it so this is something very interesting now um now i would like to kind of just uh, I, I think i'm running out of time but uh, i just like to mention here is um, when we are talking about health risk is it the interface between animals and humans and uh, you know and because i would like to mention because of this entire uh, episodic um, you know uh, you know the, the fact that um, understanding of the pandemic and the fact that these uh, that human exposure uh, uh, human exposure to pathogens from animal is a key determinant of the pandemic risk and uh, these pathogens cause disease in animals including livestock and in fact as high as 75% of pathogens capable are capable of causing human diseases are now of animal origin so uh, essentially they are zo uh, zoonotic disease in fact all flu versus uh, flu viruses are zoonotic um so very quickly i would like to um go on to the fact that in order to cope up with these problems you know what um uh, that uh, that what the institutions as well as the society um uh, uh, you know does is that we indulge in identifying risk groups so it could be risk groups very quickly it could be the immigrant population as in the case of in, in, in india what happened was that you know like the immigrant population when they were traveling from one uh, one state to the other they were identified as the risk group or it could be the religious and ethnic minorities the slum dwellers the health workers doctors nurses sanitation mortuary workers all of them are stigmatized in fact and you know uh, even of the fact that they are the ones who are the caregivers but again they are seen as the carriers of the disease so for example how doctors and nurses were ill treated we have seen you know so many examples of that and uh, you know and uh, in their own neighborhoods in fact and um, uh, and 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 again and uh, and you know so again uh, while mentioning this i would like also like to talk about this risk compensation for the fact that you know this um i don't have the time to go into details of what is risk comp compensation but i'm just giving an example that wearing uh, face coverings for example especially in when you're going outdoors it say that it's mandated and recommended in more than 160 countries to reduce transmission and uh, so previously the world health organization had warned that uh, wearing medical masks when not indicated it kind of kind of created a false uh, you know sense of security that can uh, lead to uh, neglecting other essential measures it could be you know like uh, it uh, so you know like there were these uh, measures that they like like it could be use of sanitizer hand wash and so on and so forth again uh, th there is this huge debate whether to travel or not to travel so because we are in this uh, you know because we are in the state of greater interconnectivity you know and between uh, not only through mega cities but you know through smaller and uh, you know uh, smaller um, cities and um, and towns as well and a bit uh, through major transport hubs through aircraft trains and ships and whatever and so on and so forth so uh, you know there has been this huge increase in international travel so nearly 4.4 billion flights were taken in 2018 and 2.63 billion in 2012 so you can see that you know the the, the travel has almost doubled in 6 years right 
and but uh, but in a report that kind of came up um um it's just a second uh, that says that, uh, yeah, it, that there's this report on 26 J uh, June 2020. It kind of published a story that whether cor uh, that coronavirus, how safe it is to get on a plane. Now, it kind of um, it kind of suggested that in April, uh, this entire there has been a mass reduction in global air travel, and in fact, it has gone down by 95 percent compared with last year. So, and previously also I've measured, I've mentioned about the travel restrictions and, uh, and other, you know, and quarantine policies that are kind of imposed by countries. Uh, again, um, so, so there has been a debate, like, you know, whether at all we should, uh, that the, the flights should be, uh, that, uh, that we should go on with the flights or not. And uh, as late as 21st August Times published a report saying that you might not catch coronavirus on a plane, but air travel is still probably spreading COVID-19. Uh, now, another very important thing that I would like to mention here is death and dying during the age of COVID, as in what is happening to all the dead bodies that are kind of, you know, um, you know, uh, 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 that, that are kind of being lumped up and they are being kind of, um, and how are they kind of being treated? So as, as the death rates are increasing and what happens to these dead bodies? And uh, not only what uh, whether they kind of get the proper uh, whether the that they get a dignified um, funeral, or and obviously because this is something that has we have noticed that that funerals and the nature of funerals has dramatically changed in the last few months, and because because this is something that uh, again I, I could just go back and historically it's it's you know that people kind of uh, uh, you know they kind of perceive a threat from um dead bodies um in uh, during epidemics and especially the diseased uh, the diseased dead bodies now the world health organization recommends packing and transporting a body fully sealed in an impermeable body bag before being removed from the isolation area to avoid leakage of the body fluid as the novel coronavirus transmits through respiratory droplets and count uh, contact rules Apart from that, obviously, you need to wear gloves and wash hands and, 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 and you know, take and, uh, you know, take proper precautions during the disposal of the dead body. But what I'm trying to get at is that uh, this is something of, it has been a great concern that there has been no dignity that has been given to the dead. Uh, and in, in many of I'm not saying all in all cases, but it, but in several cases that bodies have been dumped. This has been seen in, in New York. It has been seen in the case of Brazil, where dead bodies were just all, uh, you know, dumped all together. And, uh, you know, like um, they were not given uh, uh, due respect. And in, in fact, in case of I would like to mention here that there was this video that had been going around uh, in Bengal, and it it, it was uh, of a civic work uh, of civic workers, with the kind of dragging, uh, dragging and dumping dead bodies of COVID nineteen patients. That kind of obviously created and uh, and caused massive public outrage and questioning the insensitive handling of the issue. So, which again, kind of you know, accusing the the state government of the undignified cremation. Now, um, Kolkata Municipal Corporation uh, personnel loading the decomposed bodies again was seen into a van outside the uh, the Gorea crematorium while locals again protesting against the cremation of uh, of several bodies at the crematorium so this is something that again uh, you know like uh, people are always scared of infection the disc the, and the spread of infection that if uh, if the particular crematorium is close uh, is to some, uh, to the residential areas that that just might not be very conducive or that might be a cause of the spread of the disease further spread of the disease and um and and in in fact it was only in june uh, june 10 that the calcutta uh, that the kolkata civic body relaxed you know like their norms on disposal of covid 19 victim bodies previously their family members uh, previously in the sense like uh, earlier than june the the family members were not even allowed to kind of you know uh, bid their final goodbye and bid farewell to the you know except maybe uh, one or two family members but now uh, family members are allowed to be there and to pay their last respects to the victim from a distance, though. 
so and and because and this is something that you know uh, that the uh, the uh, the kolkata municipal corporation they said that they were forced to do this and they were to re to rethink about this entire thing because of the fact that families of the coronavirus patients were uh, you know or were kind of requesting them that they would like to do this but again there are other instances in case of in, in supposedly in, in uh, suppose in case of delhi where uh, you know bodies of uh, the, the covid-19 patients were just you know like they were just thrown away even by their own family members and the and where uh, the entire work was done by the mortuary workers and the you know and uh, you know and uh, and 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 they never bothered to kind of or they were too scared to um to kind of be present during their last rites so um and and when we are talking about funerals is something that you know because funeral is a place where you know we all come together to express grief and to express the fact that you know our respect and it's a time when we kind of talk, you know it, it, it's a place where we all get together and express our love and affection and uh, of our loved ones so something that as well has changed right so uh, public gatherings were not allowed um, very until very recently and even if it is and uh, there there are restrictions on the number so there is like uh, especially in a place like in india where you know like uh, you, where when we're talking about the mourners it's not just the primary mourners it's the uh, that when i'm talking about the primary mourners i mean the immediate family and friends but we have uh, relatives and distant re relatives who would also like to come and offer their uh, respect and and so on and so forth but something that has been completely dismantled but this is just not in the case of india even in 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 western countries we've seen in italy this that that you know people are kind of observing the funerals through video conferencing and uh, and and so so yes the coronavirus has been kind of changing and how and you know uh, you know this entire idea about funeral not the idea but how we are practicing the funeral uh, funerals and also how we are kind of dealing with dead so um so uh, so there are no funerals and uh, even in so death in quarantine leaves no way to grieve as one of the news reports kind of said so um just to kind of uh, going um hopefully uh, in another few minutes i hope to kind of end my talk uh, so again as i mentioned there has been a resurgence of cases and um, in in fact uh, as this today's report says there have been the world health organization has reported there are 40000 more coronavirus cases that are and uh, in fact germany has recorded its high uh, highest daily number of new cases so when we are talking about um, you know that different nations are facing different problems there's a second wave of coronavirus and outbreak of the uh, coronavirus and perhaps the virus is mutating and and we don't know how the second wave will actually turn out to be and uh, in fact scientists and medical researchers they are saying that the second wave might just be more dangerous and might uh, you know than the first wave itself and um, so now uh, another uh, important factor that I would like to talk about is this vaccine nationalism. That who gets to hold the vaccines first? So the uh, you know because everyone is kind of saying that you know every nation, be it America, be it Russia, be it UK, everyone is saying that you know that we have started our human trials and you know and we are going to be coming out with our vaccines first. And um, but the truth is at this point the vaccine isn't available. Right. So, um, so the UK uh, has purchased at uh, at least one ninety million doses, including hundred million of the vaccine can, uh, candidate being developed by the University of Oxford and the pharmaceutical company AstraZeneca. So now, um, so you know, and and uh, and in fact, uh, India also has been promised of you know of the fact that you know we'll be getting these vaccines. But again, it's a very very tricky question at this point that even once the vaccine is out which country will get it first and who will get it second and how will this entire thing be done the entire process it's in fact is very very confused at, at, at least it seems to be very confusing and it and it needs a lot of um, thought from the government and uh, you know at, at various levels and uh, different ex, ex um, you know experts at uh, and researchers need to kind of come out uh, come up uh, with the, with the solution because um, at the moment we've been waiting and there have been um, there are more than 7.5 billion people in need of the vaccination 
right? And but perhaps only a billion doses are available in the first six months of production production. So this is something that we we really need to kind of uh, we need to kind of uh, pay heed to. Now, I would like to again, um, uh, as we um, approach near, near of our talk, I would like to talk about the role of journalism in a global pandemic. Now, as we know that from the very day that we have been facing this, uh, you know, uh, we've been facing the pandemic, there has been a lot of news and, and there have been a lot of reports. And, uh, the, and in fact, the pandemic coverage has been huge, uh, as we have seen over the last few months. But and uh, but something that we need to kind of also kind of uh, reckon with the fact that there that every day you know because we still don't know the exact nature of COVID nineteen in the sense that you know uh, we have, we were first human to human transmission there has been uh, of late there uh, I think last month there was this notice that you know it could be. Um, airborne disease, something that the World Health Organization, which hasn't still kind of spoken about in details, we have not been informed that we, there has no, uh, you know, proper, um, you know, uh, research as to say whether uh, to what extent it can be and if, if, if it is and then what we need to do. So along with, uh, you know, so journalists now are kind of, you know, facing their own challenges because, you know, because we are, because they're expected to provide a uh, uh, you know, us with the accurate information, but with the fact that you know there has been this, uh, uh, you know, this overflow of information across the, uh, the internet, and uh, many a times we see that unverified uh, news, uh, news and reports kind of being flashed into into the media. So apart from the commercial media houses, when I'm talking about like the television or um, and other other uh, media uh, reports, be the print media or the television media or the radio, we, there is a uh, social media again has played a very, very significant role. So it could be it in positively, it has contributed positively in the sense that, you know, the people are kind of taking out, ma making small videos and saying and, you know, and informing about. So we are getting to know what is happening even in the deepest of the deepest corner of a particular country. And again, it has also kind of been quite misleading and, and uh, giving, uh, uh, you know, distorted um, uh, you know, uh, news and reports, and uh, has um, what we what can be called as half baked news, and and without kind of even checking, you know, like many of these media houses, uh, you know, pick up on these social media um, reports, and they kind of make a very uh, big news item or a story, or even a nice uh, nine time prime uh, prime time um, show out of it. So this is something that is scary, and uh, we and we as a society needs to be more responsible. How that would be happen, we don't know because every political party um, has their own, uh, you know, several so, uh, social media pages and so on and so forth. So this is something very important that uh, you know, and this is all one kind of contributed in creating this fear and anxiety. And, you know, um, you know, and because of the fact that we've been constantly we are being bombarded with news and uh, and this lack of uh, liability has kind of obviously created problems because because obviously news should be politically neutral. But this is something that definitely we don't find um, as at least, uh, you know, we don't find. And this is something that the COVID-19 has again kind of proven. And um, uh, so, um, so before I end, I would like to kind of uh, mention two things that I kind of um, saw today on the um, t uh, today on the net. Um, one is a, uh, I think the first. Uh, so I would uh, that uh, yes, and uh, that there has been this. Uh, the I think the uh, medical examination and the engineering examination, which have not been postponed. And uh, I, I think the, the Supreme Court has given the ruling that they would be continued because it, it kind of said that, you know, the top court has it kind of dismissed uh, the, the petition by students to defer the exa exams. It said that the careers of the students cannot be put under jeopardy uh, as, as life cannot be stopped. COVID may continue for another year or more. Are you going to wait another year? And that's the question. But again, very interestingly, today uh, I found that the IPL 2020, that Delhi's capital uh, capitals Indian players depart, uh, they depart for the UAE. So the Mumbai Indians, Chennai Super Kings, Royal Challengers, Bangalore, Kolkata Knight Riders, Rajasthan Royals, and Kings Eleven Punjab have already reached the UAE for the upcoming edition of the IPL. 
So this is the kind of, you know, the air bubble that we'll be living into that in, on one hand, we are, uh, you know, there's this constant threat of uh, that, you know, weather and the risk that, you know, we are, we, whenever we switch on a uh, news channel, we are seeing that, you know, the number of uh, deaths rising. And, and here again, like, you know, like nothing really stops because life, because at, at this point, the government is, uh, and their take is that, you know, that, 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 that life cannot just stop. So we need to go on. So, yes, yeah, so there are very uh, significant questions that we need to kind of raise that definitely that life cannot stop but um but hopefully that would not uh put uh, you know anyone at the at, at the risk at the health risk um at this point and uh and and obviously and so and this and and the there has to the and in order to kind of to, because disease outbreaks are epidemics they're very so you know very complex phenomenon you know and that 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 kind of intertwined between the medical social and political and you know engagement so so we there has to be this constant uh, dialogue between responders and communities and we need to kind of empower the general people the community i mean if here uh, the government needs to kind of come forth and um, and the international organizations again need to kind of you know uh, play a very significant role in order to kind of um just see to it that that though we would obviously be faced with um we are being faced with a with with the covid 19 but we just need to kind of um be more positive and and you know come up with something better and hopefully things will get better with time yes thank you uh thank you uh ma'am for this engaging and enlightening session today uh uh, Ma'am, uh, we will have questions as I have requested our participants. Uh, if they have any questions or queries or observations, they can put them down in the comment section of Facebook and YouTube both. So uh, we are on YouTube and Facebook. But before uh, uh, we are, we can see that I can see that uh, there are questions and again the words of praise uh, the participants, the viewers they have uh, put. Uh, in the comment section so before that uh, actually i like to know from you that uh, about uh, a medicine historian so if we think about the role of medicine historian that we know that it's not their uh, job or task to uh, make a research on uh, uh, the innovation of the vaccine uh, and you are right that it's a very big question right now who will hold past uh, the vaccine and who who are going to uh, who is going to uh, declare himself or themselves or their country or their authority or their government that who have discovered who have brought into public for the first time the vaccine uh, kind of vaccine but uh, medicine historian it says that they generally deep dig differ into social history personal history again the medical history or uh, surgical history so we have, uh, if, if we try to uh, make a, uh, uh, if we try to analyze the uh, history, as you have uh, said that uh, Corona uh, pandemic, uh, the idea that came to into our mind or came into our, came into existence from China. So uh, from that perspective, we can think about uh, it has its social history. Now, uh, if we like to know about the personal history of any pen pandemic, so be it Ebola or be it uh, uh, coronavirus. So, what would be your take on that personal history? So, is there any uh, such relation uh, the personal history and uh, the coming out of the breaking out of uh, virus? Uh I am sorry, but I didn't. I didn't quite get your question. But whatever I, I little I understood from that is that yes. you're trying to ask whether whether what is happening during COVID nineteen can be compared to the uh, epidemic or the pandemics of the earlier times. Are you trying to ask, or you're yes. asking that what is the role of a medical historian and what uh, in the in the sense of what uh, we offer because we are not scientists or we are not yes 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 uh, what yeah. we do. exactly. Um, so I, I think um, you know. So um, historians, as historians, I don't think it's our. Uh, it's 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 you know. It's not. It doesn't fall within our parameters to kind of uh, say uh, to say that what's the future is going to be like, or we can't predict the future. But rather, what we could do is uh, that you know that um, 
and just with with our with our knowledge of what of the past we what we do is that we kind of try to understand the deeper social and cultural and the political implications of what is going on and we could just uh, kind of offer um uh, maybe certain understanding of 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 something as serious as a pandemic and you know being being a hist uh, you know historian of um public health i would say that you know like for example that what's happening and how it's going to uh, like in, in the, um, when i'm saying what's happening in the say that the, the nature and uh, and 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 how it's going to uh, unfold in the coming years and uh, and rather rather more than that the social uh, uh, as i say the implications and and we can just go and study that in 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 and we can have a deeper understanding of that and with the help of uh, you know what happened in the past for example when i'm talking about the cholera outbreak in the 19th century or uh, if I, or the plague uh, or, you know or the plague in towards the uh, end of the 19th and the, uh, and definitely in, in the early 20th century or the spanish flu we can just you know just draw comparisons and try to understand that what has been the general patterns of epidemic and pandemics over the centuries and how societies react to that so as a whole how we understand disease and how we respond to that and that kind of uh, you know that says a lot because for example um, like for example we are, let's just take the example of covid-19 so when it uh, struck us uh, when when it happened in the month of march especially when when i'm saying it didn't obviously it it, it kind of was reported back in january and then uh, by february it was the, it was present in uh, in some of the countries but in india when i'm saying that you know the center of fear of coronavirus uh, started kind of increasing and uh, and the lockdown started and everything started in the month and towards the second or third week of march um so uh but around that time people were not really aware of what a pandemic is or was or uh, they have been asked questions that has it been completely unprecedented in the fact that you know something like you know they were uh, people uh, you know they came up with the stories that you know we have never seen such a thing ever before and uh, and of course you know like the world has never actually um uh, uh, you know like um faced such a problem in such a such global scale because you know at the end of the day the world was never uh, as uh, connected as ever you know as before due to as i as, as i was mentioning due to the air travel you know the cheaper air travels you know like one dis uh, like you know, if someone gets infected with covid-19 and because, because with covid-19 especially uh, that you could be asymptomatic as uh, as well as symptomatic so if you're an asymptomatic carrier a kind of travels from one place to the other maybe in maybe one someone is flying from london to india or from london to new york he or she could be the carrier and without even realizing he or she could just you know uh disperse the disease and could just infect more and more people so this is something this is exactly how the epidemic the uh, the the the, the, the covid-19 kind of started right so and um and so even in the in the first phase of the pandemic of the pandemic if i could call it so people were not uh, people were kind of trying to say okay this is a matter of two weeks and we'll be in the lockdown and then we'll be getting out over with it but i was like you know when i was speaking to my family members and my friends i was one thing that i was going on mentioning is that this is something not it's not a, it's not a matter of weeks it's not a matter of months for us but this just might go on you know and because we uh, you know like uh, as a society i think we have been um more obsessed and in the sense of more obsessed we have been kind of uh, thinking that we we have won over science and uh, we have been expecting too much out of uh, me medical research and scientific and medical innovation and so there were these uh, you know like there's this constant pressure from the media uh, not that you know the scientists really kind of um, they know how to do it and they are, they are more, uh, much more informed and uh, uh, about uh, how things are going to happen but there is this constant thing that you know this particular vaccine the vaccine uh, would be available in the next couple of months or in 6 months and so on and so forth but uh, one thing that we really need to understand that this is all uh, that you know a bit as a you know as a as a human society this is some we are expecting too much and too fast so we, we you know things can't really um, 
be fine at you know for drop of hat or you know in the next few months this will go on because if you, if you study cholera or a uh, cholera outbreak or the plague they had several uh you know outbreaks so there there was this 1817 and that was followed in the 1820s 1830s and again 1840s and again 1860s but that was a time when obviously this i'm not saying that's going to happen now because we're going to because we are far in a far far better position in the sense where medical research is concerned because we are, we should be able to produce something a vaccination hopefully by next year but again hopefully by next year that's not going to be happening like you know people were thinking that that some we will be able to kind of uh, uh listening to some positive news by the end of august or september if that happens because because as as i was reading the other day that it's, it's difficult to kind of get some positive news on on the front uh by the end by christmas so maybe we can expect something early next year but even if that yes. happens you know the the number of doses would be restricted so as i as i as i ended with that there are 7.55 billion doses so that won't be possible right so we need to have our own coping up mechanism and we need to kind of you know like understand that fine you know we have progressed a lot scientifically and the medical research has done you know uh, fantabulously but at the end of the day you know uh, you know we need to understand the reality and we need to kind of uh, as i say have our own uh, coping mechanisms and we need to understand that um, but again i mean because you know many people have asked me that you know what do you, what do you think about the lockdown and quarantine and all of that this is some is this something that happened just now no no of course not you know this is something that has happened uh, centuries before uh, starting uh, from the lazarettos being built and then again in the 19th century we have seen quarantine uh, in you know uh, and um, uh, like you know people being quarantined just being quarantined and um, this, this is something not before but as i say that the entire scale has been huge because the first global uh, epi- uh, pandemic uh, you know cholera is supposedly it's kind of labeled as something that kind of you know, uh, you know there was an article that uh, Valis, by valaska huber who kind of who said uh, you know who kind of called uh, called an article that um, uh, unification of global by a, by a uh, by a disease so and that disease is cholera and again uh, and then when we are talking about plague you know it started in 19 uh, in um, in 1996 no sorry sorry 1896 i'm so sorry and uh, 1894 and 1896 reached india and by the end in in, uh, in the next um, by uh, in the next 30 to 40 years almost every continent had been touched by the disease and everyone had been affected and uh, same similar situation was in the case of flu but as i say you know that's the reason i was uh, you know in my talk i was kind of trying to kind of emphasize on the travel restrictions and the trade embargoes and whether that you know how how um how the different uh, how different nations and the government are kind of trying to kind of differentiate between essential traveling or for, or you know traveling for the purpose of holiday or recreation because it's only the, if you're traveling if it's, if your travel is absolutely essential it's only then in most countries i'm not saying all as i mentioned i've kind of given a overview of the nations who have kind of imposed and what what was the nature of the travel uh, restrictions but it, it, this is just an, a method you know how to kind of uh, in order to kind of contain the disease as i said because if and um, obviously there are a lot of other is, uh, issues and in, in, in the sense that um, in india for example uh, there are from uh, flights from london or new york uh, they are only to um, delhi and calcutta and maybe another few um, cities here and there but i suppose in the last three uh, last i think there were two flights direct flights to calcutta and since then there have been no flights to calcutta no direct flights so either you have to kind of travel through another city that can be through a, via bangalore and so on and so forth or so so this is all done because you know because uh, like obviously the state government are is uh, currently the chief minister she is kind of fearing that you know if, if there are more people coming in and if they happen to be the carriers if they happen to carry the the virus then more people would be infected so uh, yeah i don't know i mean i'm just um, yes. digressing but i'm just no, no, no. Uh, that, you know, how important uh, you know and how how all of these things are linked and interlinked yes yes and, uh, and again uh, some uh, saying uh, it's true that if we try to uh differentiate between the attitudes uh, uh, as we know that society have 
changed in their attitude, in their approach to the disease from ancient times to the present. So how you would be able to make a uh, difference or differentiate between the attitudes of the ancient and the present? Okay, uh, thanks for the question. So this is uh, this is another question that has been uh, asked uh, uh, quite frequently in the sense that, you know, if there are any comparisons. So if and how people's attitudes have changed. For example, if I just want for, if I can just uh, pick up the example of wearing the mask, for example. So in uh, in case of the in flu, uh, the, uh, the, flu, uh, the influenza uh, pandemic of 1918, there were again that the government had kind of asked people to wear masks and in America then there were people who resisted that and they came up with the thing that we're not going to be wearing masks and it kind of affects our uh, individual freedom and so forth. Then if, if you can call up, uh, you know, hopefully we, we won't have my yeah, so there are these plague riots that kind of took place in Bombay, but and uh, thankfully there have been none of, uh, you know, as of now we haven't had, but there have been, obviously there have been a lot of social disru disruptions due to, uh, you know, due, due to all of these restrictions and lockdown measures that have been imposed by the government on different, uh, on different people, you know, on, on uh, different um, uh, yeah, yeah, on different people. For example, obviously the lockdown measures, because uh, you know, like uh, I've, I've been watching um, a lot of uh, a lot of these um, interviews and uh, by celebrities, and you know, they've been asked questions that what are you doing during lockdown, and are you having a good time? And there are many people there saying that okay, I'm frustrated. And it, obviously, the interviews, if you, if, because I find it quite interesting in the, in the, in the, maybe in the first month, people were like, okay, fine, I have finally have time to myself, and I can relax. And I can, you know, I have a good time. And then, as as time is passing, people are getting more and more frustrated. But again, if if you know, at the people at the, uh, you know, if I could just say it in simple words, people who are rich, um, you know, like they can still cope up. They can still, uh, you know, they they know what's going to happen because uh, because another very very significant thing of the game changer of the COVID nineteen would be the economic implications. And it's going to be huge, right? Because there have been uh, already there have been huge job losses, and uh, this number might just increase in the coming years. So we really need to kind of understand how to kind of cope up with this. And uh, another thing that you know, as there are economic implications, and and obviously that would again vice versa, that would again affect the society as a at large. So people, there might just come a time that, you know, when people that uh, they just get completely frustrated and they don't know and uh, sorry, that they don't know how to kind of deal with this, this entire thing. So, yeah, sorry for that. And that they, that they don't know uh, how to kind of cope up with such an such problems so yeah so 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 there are so uh, as i say that you know with pandemic you know because this is a very tricky questions that whether whether this is the, whether the society informs the pandemic or i i think it's it's both ways you know so every society reacts and uh not just society the different social stratific uh, you know stratification and as, as as i say all of them react very different to a pandemic and again, vice versa, you know, the pandemic again affects the society at, uh, society at large too. So, yes. So. Okay. Yeah. Uh, as I was mentioning about the particular uh, social groups that are being targeted or being identified as disease carriers, for example. So in, in supposedly in, in, in America, as we've seen, it's it's, it's the uh, it's it's the black Americans or the ethnic uh, you know uh, the ethnic minorities that have been kind of you know more prone to the disease, and uh, even in UK they they were saying at one point that uh, the number of uh, cases were higher. In case of India, I suppose they are saying that the number of cases in women are uh, you know are higher than of the of man. But obviously, we don't have any specific explanations to all of that. But yes, uh, it just um, says a lot of says a lot, and uh, yeah, and we need to kind of. But you know, like to come up with something more proper and to kind of have a more deeper understanding. Perhaps we need more time just to understand how this entire pandemic is going to unfold in the coming few months. Because in the initial phase, it's it was one kind, and then there was come, then comes summer, 
at least from uh, UK where I am and you know and then how how people are going to just react once the summer is gone and and you know and as we approach Christmas and as because you know and because people are obviously expecting that with the turn of uh, 2000 that the 2021 would be uh, much better so let's see yes so thank you. Now uh, I am making visible the questions uh, dropped by our participants in the comment section. And yeah. this is the uh, uh, it, it's a uh, observation by uh, that's uh, from Karnataka. Uh, yes. yes. Now this is a, a questions dropped by him. What are the ways to adopt in order to reframe global health threats? What are the ways to adopt? Uh, as I say that, you know, we need to kind of, uh, I, I, as I kind of ended my talk and I concluded with that we need to kind of come together and see when we're talking about global health, we need to kind of have, you know, solutions to, uh, you know, we need to have global solutions to global threats and global risk. So this is something that we need to all come together because public, you know, this, this, there, there was when, uh, you know, as far as history of public health goes that, you know, that, you know, you need to kind of do greater good to the greater number of people. And that needs to, we need to kind of really think of that as well as, you know, when I'm talking about uh, diseases and outbreaks and pandemics and, and all of that, we also need to really, that a time has come that we need to kind of really think about uh, other other issues of so maybe it could be ecological issues. It could be, you know, uh, as, as I said that, you know, like, because something that we have noticed, especially in India, that at a time when there were very, very there were no flights operating or at a time when there were no, uh, you know, like there was no transport on, on the road, uh, what we uh, cause it could and and uh, they were not uh, emitting any kind of you know um, uh, you know uh, and they're not kind of being sources of pollution. So you know the pollution levels really dropped and it dropped drastically. So uh, my my friend the other day she kind of showed, she had um, she was she kind of sent me this photo of Mumbai and she was saying that you know you could see the blue sky. And I have visited her, and I and, and when I visited her, I couldn't see that. And now it was all looking so beautiful. The the, the you know the grass is greener, the trees are you know the, the the trees are greener. It's a happy place. So we need to kind of you know learn a lot from this as well. And um, you know be, uh, there have been a saying that you know like such instances and such occurrences are social levelers. But unfortunately, I don't agree with that. Rather, it kind of exposes uh, the disparities, you know, and and in the greater you know because we have been um, you know that when there was this entire thing of the migrant population, for example, and people were really feeling bad, you know, that oh my God, there are so many poor people walking on the roads. They don't have uh, they don't have. Um, shoes they don't have proper chappals or whatever but one thing that we really miss that these people always existed it wasn't that they one fine day they all start to work and it's just that because they so what i'm trying to get at there were these a lot of these invisible problems that perhaps they were you know we, it was uh these kind of problems we were all we were all aware of but it was not just that we couldn't uh see them from the front so especially people from the urban uh, from the urban centers uh, we have been able you know like this particular uh, 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 you know pandemic has exposed us to a lot of other problems uh, so the problems it could be of the cities it could be of the of the towns it could be of the villages so yeah so so we have been made been made aware of a lot of other other issues as well Shubhankar Dr. does COVID-19 pandemic and its management, which is drastically different in different countries, going to redefine our understanding of developed and developing countries. As you already said, developed countries like US in a way fail to some to extent to manage it. Same with the developing countries like India. Absolutely. Uh, thanks for this question, Shubhankar. And I, I agree uh, and I agree with this. And definitely that it is it, it is already redefining because in, in the sense that, you know, um, I don't know how how um how far uh, it would register in the mind of uh, the developed nations, as they call the first world countries. But uh, I think it, it has. But this particular outbreak has uh, definitely has taught a lesson in the sense that it's uh, in any and this entire um, bridge, you know, maybe a non-existing or a very 
um, fake bridge, if I could call it so, between the developed and and, and uh, or developing nations, or maybe even and un, 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 I'm not going to get in the undeveloped countries here. But yes, and because uh, especially as you mentioned here, the management has been drastically different. This is perhaps because uh, on one hand, because I feel that. Uh, uh, because uh, you know the other nations maybe be, they thought that uh, they need to be more um, in the sense that how how could I say that uh, they they have to be more prepared uh, and they have to be more uh, because they were uh, they knew that you know once if it, this particular outbreak goes out of hand they would not be able to uh, uh, you know cope up with the situation uh, but in the case of um, uh, US that was not the um, uh, that was not the fact in fact uh, United Kingdom I would just I was just reading the other day in, on Twitter that uh, one professor he tweeted that uh, the the university stu students don't need to that the government has or the government the government I think the university adm administration has kind of said that you don't need to wear face masks and uh, when you come to class so uh, so you know it's it seems as if they still haven't learned their lessons so yeah so and because this is again a very uh, I mean, you know, as I say, when I'm saying that, you know, it's better that when you're wearing the mask, it's not because of any, it's not, in, uh, you know, rather than seeing it as something that is being imposed, it's just to kind of make you and people around you safe, right? And, but again, uh, one thing that I would again like to mention that if people might have other issues, like suppose someone, there might be, because this is another great concern and there are articles being published in major journals that uh, in uh, and that you know that um, this particular uh, that just by the fact that people are wearing masks all the time that that might just uh, trigger other respiratory diseases so people uh, this, so there are there might be people who have problems wearing them so we need to kind of understand their concerns as well and i've seen you know in, in television that that if someone is not wearing a mask or whatever you're just you know throwing water from the terrace on top of the person or whatever or behaving in a very rude manner i think there has to one has to strike a balance like you know you, if, if that that uh, people need to be socially uh, more responsible but at the same time this is uh, we are not living in it's on a it's, it's not a police state you know it, it, we are not living under surveillance all the time so I, I think uh, that's very important and and um I and I'll just to kind of answer your question shortly like yes I I, I hopefully that you know this entire uh, I think the developing nations would also kind of not only uh, gain a lot of confidence that, you know, in the sense that we have been able to do a good job. For example, in uh, United Kingdom, um, uh, Britain had fared quite well, as I, I think I, I think I mentioned that in during the talk, that, um, that, and that in, in the last, it's only in the last two, three weeks, again, as the uh, lockdown measures are kind of re more, uh, getting more relaxed, and people are kind of, I think 15 July was the date, I think people kind of could go and uh, I think government relaxed measures since then and and uh, that people are going out. So uh, as and once people are going out and in fact, people are going out for holidays and they're going, they're traveling. So once they do that, there is again, uh, you know, uh, there is again a threat of, um, uh, you know, that, that uh, there might be, and cases are rising. So, yeah. So we just need to kind of be more, um, responsible even in france for that matter or italy and you know it's happening all the way because especially it's it's summer here here and people kind of uh, sometimes they just go crazy you see that the beach, uh, that the beaches are all um they're filled with people and they're all having a good time so you know so the rules of physical uh, distancing are completely broken yes uh, thank you thank you uh, thank you uh, i think i'm audible yeah, yeah, I can hear you. Exactly. Yeah, so, so got disconnected suddenly. Okay. So, uh, thank you very much uh, for entertaining each and every question. Uh, so, it was a brilliant, brilliant session. Uh, actually, interactive session we had. Now, uh, we will end this session with a formal vote of thanks. And for that, I would like to request our students, Mondira Panda, to deliver a formal vote of thanks to our resource persons today. Mondira, are you there? I think she's muted. I think she's on mute. I think she's muted herself. M Mandira, am I audible?
Okay, uh, so uh, on behalf of my department, I, 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 oh, no, no, no. Not. Oh, she's there. Oh, oh, she's there. Am I on the phone, sir? Yes, you are. Yeah. Hello, Mundira. Okay, thank you, ma'am. Actually, some network problems. That's why I was unable to connect. Uh, so, good evening, everyone. This is Mandira from Padmanabha College, Autonomous. As all good things come to an end in life, so does today's enthralling lecture. And I am delighted to have been given the pleasant duty of delivering vote of thanks this time. On behalf of the Department of English, and on my own behalf, I want to propose a vote of thanks to those who have directly or indirectly contributed to this lecture. At the outset, I cordially thank our resource person, respected Manikarnika Dutta Ma'am from University of Oxford. We are really enlightened with your knowledge and presence, Madam. We are thankful to our Honorable Principal Sir, Dr. Gopal Chandra who has inspired us to host such lecture series. I would like to thank our Professor Tarmai Kundar Sir for his enthusiastic support and initiative during this turbulent period. A heartfelt thanks to all the participants for their active participation from all over India. With these warm words and a kind message, we'll move to the end of today's session. Thank you. Thank you all.